Or for the sake of anyone who may be online. Is there anyone online? Yes. There's, hello, everyone there in streaming land. <laughs> so uh, why don't we just um, let's wait a moment for libations to be poured. Okay. And, and I'll try to project for those of us who are hard of hearing, and I'll try to make sense for those of us who would appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, why don't we uh, go around the circle and just remind everyone of who everyone is. And we're going to start over here. Linda E. Wolfgarber. Arvind Marisa. Ayanna Silver. What kind of story? Mel Berger. Nikki Jackler. Billy Geiger. Lauren Hurwitz. Jack Lodge. Okay, good. So the story that we have today, uh, there's actually two stories, but they're about the same guy. and. They're beside each other in the Talmud, so I thought I would just give you both of them. Uh, it's by a fellow by the name of Honi. And this comes from a section of the Talmud called Ta'anit. Now, just to remind ourselves, the Talmud is a book of the rabbis discussing the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a book of the rabbis discussing Jewish law. And it's organized based upon Stream of consciousness. Okay, so Ta'anit is on the subject of fasts. Now, in the Jewish tradition and Ta'anit, they're really specifically they're fasting for one thing. Why do you think people would fast, like have a community fast? We need to declare a fast. We're in trouble. What are you fasting for? What do you want from God? Forgiveness. Could be forgiveness. But what is it that you want God to do? Oh. Help, intervention, but with what? What do we need help from God from that we're, we're willing to fast for it? As a community, it's a communal disaster. We need to fast. What do you think we're asking for? Enemies. 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 Could be enemies. A miracle. A miracle, you were saying? Survive pogroms. Survive pogroms. Okay, but there's no pogroms yet in because in, we're talking about the uh, two, three, four hundreds. Okay, but... You know, certainly there's that sort of thing. So, famine? No. Famine. You're on the right track, right? What is special about the land of Israel that is different from uh, Mesopotamia and different from Egypt? Desert environment? I don't know. Well, you're on the right track. Egypt, the Nile floods regularly, and that's how they do agriculture. Mm -hmm. And Mesopotamia, you've got the Tigris and the Euphrates. They flood regularly. That's how you have agriculture. Mm -hmm. But what are we spending half of our year praying for rain. every day? Rain. Mm -hmm. You got it. Right? Ta'anin is about praying for rain. If there is no rain, we die. Right? That's the problem with the land of Israel. It's a beautiful place, but it's inconsistent when it comes to um, uh, precipitation. So the story is coming in about Honi because Honi is, needs to produce rain. That's his job, okay? So let's just go around the circle and read. Let's start reading. The, Mi the Mishnah taught an accident occurred in which the people sent a message to Honi Himakel. This event is related in greater detail in the following Beretta. The sages taught once most of the month of Adar had passed, but rain still had not fallen. They sent this message to Honi, Hamigel, Flee, I pray, and rain will fall. We prayed, but no rain fell. Okay, some language things here. Hameagel, meagel me, uh, an agala is a circle. Meagel, the circle maker, hence the name of the topic here, right? Um, the sages are the rabbis talking in, 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 in this. A baraita is a, um, some information, a saying from the era of the Mishnah that didn't make it into the Mishnah, but it makes it into the Talmud. Okay. So how do we have somebody who we depend on to pray for rain? And how do we 
come to know that when this person prays, there's going to be rain. How did he get that? Uh, How did he get that reputation? Yeah. Well, this is the story. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Read on and you shall see. Okay. He drew a circle in the dust and stood inside it in the manner that the prophet Habakkuk did, as it is stated, and I will stand upon my watch and set myself upon the tower, and I will look out to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. This verse is taken to mean that Habakkuk fashioned a kind of prison for himself where he sat. Okay, this is the whole point of the circle, right? <clears throat> Imagine you have your three or four year old and he says, I'm going to hold my breath until you give me what I want. And then the kid passes out. Right. <laughs> so this is what Honey says. I'm drawing a circle and I'm not going to leave my circle until the rain comes. OK, on, on the on the on the scale of maturity. I mean, where is this on the scale of maturity? Right? High end or low end? It's a low end. It's like, I'm not going to move from here until you make it rain. What do you think is going to happen? Not much. Not much. <laughs> well, let's see. Okay. Henry said before God, Master of the universe, your children have turned their faces toward me as I am like a member of your household. Therefore, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have mercy upon your children and answer their prayers for rain. Rain began to trickle down, but only in small droplets. Okay. It, can you leave the circle now? Guess not. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's raining. I mean, it's a little like, you know, splutter. You know, little. So, okay, fine. You won't leave the circle until, until, until I give you uh, a candy bar. Like, okay, fine. Here's, here's like a shaving of chocolate. Okay. Now you've had it. Now go away. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, it's not good enough. Okay. The student said to him, Rabbi, we have seen that you can perform great wonders, but this, this quantity of rain is not enough to ensure that we will not die. It appears to us that a small amount of rain is falling only to enable you to dissolve your oath, but it is not nearly enough to save us. What kind of miracle worker are you? <laughs> okay. I mean, if we wanted a sprinkling like this, we could have like, I don't know. I mean, anyone could do this. This is, this is, you gotta, gotta do a bit better here. Okay. So as you did. Okay. Honey said to God, I did not ask for this, but for rain to fill the cisterns ditches and caves. Rain began to fall furiously until each and every drop was as big as the mouth of a barrel. And the sages estimated that no drop was less than a log in size. Okay, a log is a, me is a liquid measure, uh, like a gallon. Okay. Yeah. So it is yeah. pouring. Big drops. Okay, now, now, now the way that they keep uh, water is, is you have cisterns. Cisterns, when it rains, it fills up with the water, right? Uh -huh. You don't have the water flowing to the sea uh, when it rains, but you have cisterns, you have ditches, <clears> you know, <throat> that's how, how you get the water to, to you know, you capture it in the rainy season and then and it's there later. Um, I remember we were living in Maine and there was a water cistern under the street uh, for the fire department so that, you know, when it rained, it would fill up the water and then they could pull the water from it. This is from way back in the day. And I only know about it because it collapsed and um, they had to repair the street, but that's why. But there was a fire. But there was a fire station, an old fire station at the end of the street, and there was a sister. Honest to goodness, the, the rainwater would go there. Okay. So, what's the problem now? Too much rain. Too much rain. Okay. Who is being immature now? <laughs> God is right. You want rain? I'll give you rain. Okay, Mickey. The student said to him, Rabbi, we have seen that you can call on God to perform miracles and we will not die. But now it appears to us that rain is falling only to destroy the world. Okay, too much of a good thing. Okay, what's Honey gonna do? Honey again said before God, I did not ask for this harmful rain either, but for rain of benevolence, blessing, and generosity. Subsequently, 
The rain fell, rain fell in the standard manner, and so all of the people fell higher ground and ascended to the Temple Mount due to the rain. Okay, it's flooding. Okay, it's flooding. They have to go to higher ground. By the way, um, you'll notice that some of the text is in boldface and some of it is in not boldface, right? So the Talmud is kind of a cryptic text. The boldface is what the Talmud says. The, the, the unboldface is what we have to add in so that the Talmud makes sense, okay? So those are the words that we're adding in, strong for Rashi and other commentators to help make sense of this, okay? So it's, it's raining, right? It's flooding. Now it's raining normal, but it's still raining, right? Learn. They said to him, Rabbi, just as you prayed that the rain should fall, so too pray that they should stop. Keep going. He said to them, this is the tradition that I received that one does not pray over an excess of good. Tony continued, <laughs> nevertheless, bring me a bowl. I will sacrifice it as a thanks offering and pray at the same time. Okay, what's he doing here? Negotiating. He's <laughs> hedging his bets. Right. Right? He's saying, okay, look, um, too much of a good thing. You, you don't sell someone to stop a good thing, but maybe if we say thank you, God will take the hint that that'll be enough, right? Because, you know, when someone offers you something and you don't want it, you say thank you, right? You know, that, that's what I was taught, you know, would you like something to drink? Yes, please means yes, and thank you means no, which confused people who would say thank you, and then they didn't get anything because no one would bring it because they interpreted that as a no. So just just let's let's give a thanks offering. God likes bulls. I don't know how we're going to sacrifice it in the rain, but we'll do the best. We're on the Temple Mount anyways. Let's go for it. Okay, Jack. Uh, they brought him a bull for a thanks offering. He placed his two hands on its head and said before God, Master of the universe, your nation Israel, whom you brought out of Egypt, cannot uh, bear either an excess of good or an excess of punishment. You were angry with them and withheld rain, and they are unable to bear it. You bestowed upon them too much good, and they were also unable to bear it. May it be your will that the rain stop and that there be relief for the world. Okay. Sometimes you need to explain things to God in language that God can understand, right? Okay. And uh, Linda, what's the result? Immediately the wind blew, the clouds dispersed, the sun shone, and everyone went out to the fields and gathered for themselves truffles and mushrooms that had sprouted in the strong rain. Okay. So this is a great story so far, right? Yeah. Okay, what's the problem with this story? It's like turning God on and off. Right, it's like God is not soap on a rope, as they say, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a little worrying. This is not how prayer is supposed to work. This is not how God is supposed to work. This is how magic works, right? Magic is, you know, I say it and it happens, right? They're a little bit worried, you know, that, that this is this is bad theology. Okay. So okay. Uh, Shimon ben Shetach relate to Honi Hamaagel. If you were not Honi, I would have decreed ostracism upon you. I would have had you excommunicated. Huh. Okay. For were these years like the years of Elijah, when the keys of rain were entrusted in Elijah's hands? and he swore it would not rain. Wouldn't the name of heaven have been desecrated by your oath not to leave the circle until it rained? Right, so if it, when Elijah was praying and there wasn't rain, it's because you decreed there wouldn't be rain. How can you go and say, no, no, we have the power to overrule God. Right? How can you do that? Keep going. Once you have pronounced this oath, either yours or Elijah's must be falsified. However, what can I do to you as you nag God and he does your bidding like a son who nags his father and his father does his bidding? And the son says to his father, Father, take me to be bathed in hot water, wash me with cold water, give me nuts, almonds, peaches, and pomegranates. And his father gives him. About you, the verse states, 
your father and mother will be glad, and she who bore you will rejoice. It's, it's, he's throwing his hands up in the air. It's like, you are sui generis. Like, you, I, I don't know what to do, but we're not going to use you as, as a highlight for other people to be like you. Mm -hmm. right? do, do you think Shimon Ben Shetap is right to be uh, concerned about this? Is that a valid complaint? What's the problem with miracle workers? You sure expect a lot from them, and then when they fail for some reason, they're in trouble, or the people are in trouble, somebody's mm -hmm. in trouble, mm -hmm. because they're not doing, it's mm -hmm. not working. This mm -hmm. isn't working. Right. <clears throat> Faith in God is more important than miracle work, believing in God, and not necessarily miracle. Right. And if the reason God withholds the reins is because we're sinning, shouldn't the answer be, well, we'll stop sinning and make repentance? If you can just get rid of the punishment like that, how effective is punishment as a way of modifying our behavior? Right. Mm -hmm. It's making God look like an indulgent parent, right? Who's got their, whose child has got them wrapped around their finger. It's, we're not so sure about this. We're not sure we like this. Okay, so let's continue. The sage is taught what message did the members of the chamber of the human stone, the great Shahedrin, send to Huni Mahagaya? About you, the verse states, you shall also decree a matter, and it shall be established for you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. When they cast down, your, you will say, there is lifting up, for he saves the humble person. He will deliver the one who is not innocent, and he will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. Okay, so we've just quoted a verse. It says, Honey, you exemplify this verse. And you'll notice the Talmud only bothers to, like, quote the first half of the verse, and then we fill in the rest of the verse, because it's got a lot of stuff here. And now what the Talmud's going to do in the next section here is for each and every sentence fragment, each and every clause, we're going to say what that means. Okay. And that's why I put it with little bullet points. Right. Okay. So Mark, why don't you give us the, the first they bullet point. <clears throat> you shall also decree a matter, you, Moni, decree from below and the Holy One, lest be he, fulfills your statement from above. Good. Mel? Good. And the light shall shine upon your ways. A generation that was in darkness, you have illuminated it, it with your prayer. Okay. Thank you. When they cast down, you will say, there is lifting up. A generation that was cast down, you lifted it up with your prayer. Okay. For he saves the humble person. A generation that was humble in its transgression, you saved it through your prayer. Mm -hmm. You would deliver the one who is not innocent a generation that was not innocent you have delivered it through your prayer mm -hmm. and he will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands you have delivered an undeserving generation through the clean work of your hands okay what are they trying to say Well, that uh, God sometimes uh, does good to people who don't, don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And why is God doing good things for the people who don't deserve it? I mean, it is people of Israel, so mm -hmm. yeah. that's it. But why is God doing good things for us? Because of Honey. Because of Honey. You're magic. You're special. You're great. You are the most wonderful thing. You are like one of the miracle workers, right? Pony is a really great guy. So what are we going to expect? If you've got a narrative and a story um, and you see a character really, really build, built up to like almost impossible standards, what do you expect a narrative is going to do next? Well, he might fall down. They're going to tear him down. Of course they're going to tear him down, right? This is what we're going to do because 
that's how literature works, right? <laughs> this is literature, right? So we have another story uh, about, um, about Homi, right? So we're gonna start a new narrative. A any questions or, or comments about what we've said so far? I have a um, question that doesn't pertain to the story so much mm -hmm. as, as just, a, I guess, a technical aspect of the topic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The bold, the bold words are what's in the Talmud. Right. Okay. So, do I assume that the parentheses showing proverbs and, and well, not Job, okay, but proverbs and some of the other um, parenthetical comments that, that it's also that's not in the Talmud, but but the, but that's where they're quoting from. The Talmud does quote from po proverbs. And stuff. Right. Right. Okay. So, so, okay. so what's happening here is is. Like if you look at the top of the page, you have this verse um, where it says, you shall decree a matter and it shall be established for you and the light shall shine upon your ways. And then it just goes straight through, you shall decree matter, you decree from below. So um, it quotes the beginning of the verse and or the set of verses. And what the editor of this edition of the Talmud has done is they've added in the rest of the verse and they've added in the citation to let us know where they're quoting it from, right? Because rabbinic literature assumes that you have the Bible memorized. And all it has to do is quote the beginning of a verse and you know it. This happens in the Passover Haggadah, okay? The Passover Haggadah is supposed to tell a story from our, um, when we were down low to when we're up high. Okay, from the Gnuchi to the Sheva, right? And there's an argument between Rav and Shmuel as to what is the difference between our being low and our being high, okay? So one of the answers is we were slaves and then we were free. So that's the whole Arami of Edovi. Uh, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down to Egypt and, and we take that verse apart that sectional part, and then we go each individual clause in that first, and we elucidate it until we've, you know, spilled blood for all of the all of the plates, right? It takes pages and pages and pages. Do any of you remember where it talks about us being idolaters in the Haggadah? No, no, you don't, right? It's in there. Right before the whole, my father was a wandering Aramean, there's this little section that says, um, God gave uh, the land of Israel to us, and he gave Seir to Asaph, right? You remember that little section? And it's like this little thing, and it doesn't tell you anything. Like, but you have to understand, that's a quotation from um, Joshua. And that's Joshua starting a speech. And in his speech, Joshua says, Mount Seir I gave to Asaph, right? And you guys I gave Israel. And know that your father Terah used to worship idols but abraham chose god and now i declare before all of you today that we believe in god and then all the people said yes we believe in god that's a whole section there but you're supposed to know it by heart all they had to do was quote the beginning of the section for joshua and your brain's supposed to fill in the rest but the Haggadah doesn't have it because they only quoted them a little bit. Now, I use a Haggadah that actually fills in the rest of the passage. And it's like, oh my goodness, now this makes sense. Because otherwise, this little bit of, of, of Joshua doesn't take me anywhere. Right? That's how, that's how cryptic writing works, right? They are always trying to save space. All right. So, you know, so we fill in, we fill in the narrative sinew, right? 
But that's a good observation. Yeah. Any other questions about about you know just how the text is put together or what is Talmud or any of those things? Because I'm open to those. But we all know what Talmud is. If you had to explain Talmud to a friend, could you do it? Okay, quick review. Just just to let you know where all these stories are coming from. Thank you. <laughs> okay. General rule, if you don't know what something is, odds are nobody else knows it either. Right? That's why questions are good. Okay. God gives Torah to humankind at Mount Sinai. Gives it in two forms, written and oral. The written stuff is written down. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses. And by extension later on, um, all the books of the prophets. And all up. And all of the writings. That's all what's considered written. Torah, Iktav. The Torah Sheba al oral stuff, is all of the other details when Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, God all told him all the regulations and stuff. And that was told, Moses told it to, to Joshua, Joshua told it to the elders, the elders told it to the sages, the sages told it to the rabbis. Now, around the year 200, the Romans were being very... Um, irritable to the Jewish nation. We kind of rebelled and um, they were being mean to us. You know, they destroyed our temple and all sorts of things. And we decided that, the rabbis decided, if we don't write down this oral teaching, no one's going to remember it. So they wrote it down into something called the Mishnah. Now there was other stuff that didn't make it into the Mishnah. There was the Tosefta, which is kind of like the Mishnah that didn't make it, but that at least was written down. And then there was all the Baraitas, which were not written down, they were just remembered. As time goes along, around the year 400 in Israel, the year 600 in Babylon where we're writing, again, they thought maybe we should write this down. Because the rabbis have all these discussions based upon what they've read in the Mishnah. So they write that stuff down. It's called the Gemara. And the Gemara includes all of the Baraitas. Right? The Mishnah plus the Gemara is what we call the Talmud. And the way the Talmud is presented on paper is it'll have a section of Mishnah and then the Gemara to that Mishnah. And then they'll have another little section of Mishnah and then more Gemara to that Mishnah. And then, because we can't leave well enough alone, we have marginalia. marginalia. So for the most part, on the inside margin, you'll have Rashi. Rashi is a word-by-word um, -word commentary on the Talmud to explain what the heck it means, okay? Fill in the gaps and things. On the other side, we have the Tosafot. The Tosafot are the generation of Rashi's grandchildren, and they're not interested in line by line or word by word what it means. They're concerned with, well, over here it says A, but in a different section of the Talmud elsewhere, the similar topic comes up and they rule it differently. How do we reconcile these two different things? So like they're short little essays on things. And then you get, you know, where does this show up in, in the codes? So there's little notes about that. But that's what that's what Talmud looks like. Okay. Um, 
Talmud reaches its final edited form around the year 800. Okay. So when we talk about Talmud, we're talking about the Mishnah and the commentary on the Mishnah called the Gemara. Okay. Good. Before you really say yeah. So the Torah is written. Yeah. The oral is not written until later. Right. Okay. So when we were talking about that, um, the, the, the Torah was was uh, the written Torah was mm -hmm. memorized. Right. Okay. How many years difference are we with the um, codification of the Talmud relative to the Bible? Well, there's two different answers to that. One is the traditional religious answer. And then there's the, well, here's what we think archaeology has to tell us. Okay? The traditional answer is that these five books date from the time of Moses. It's like in like negative 1300-ish. And the prophets, they each wrote their own book when it happened. And the writings were written as it happened. The close, there's nothing, there's nothing earlier than minus 400-ish, maybe minus 300 in terms of years. Um, the scientific view is that um, the five books of Moses that we know, the Torah, and Deuteronomy is that Deuteronomy gets written down around the time of Josiah, which I think is like the 800s, minus 800. And uh, the rest of the stuff is older. And then when we're in the Babylonian dispersion in minus 400, minus 500-ish, in Babylon, this all gets edited together, right? But all of this is like old. It's before the time of the Maccabees, okay? The book of Maccabees is written, um, I guess minus 200 or so. Um, these are after, these are written after the destruction of the temple, written temple. So there's a gap of years. So they've had plenty of time to memorize the written. Right. And, and, but the written's already been written down. They didn't need to memorize it. It's written. No, but but they but we said that they. Um, oh no! What I'm saying is, when they're writing this book here, and they write down something, they assume that either you've memorized it or that you can find it. Okay. You can look it up, right? They're just they're just giving you the first few lines so that you'll you know say the rest of it to yourself. Okay. And even the. Back then, even the written were mainly oral. Yeah. Right. I mean, all, not everyone had a book. Not everyone had a book, but but right. guess what? Everyone they written. read it in the synagogue every week. Yeah. And, and it made sense. Um, Hebrew is the language of this. Hebrew is the language of the Mishnah. Aramaic is the language of the Gemara. Well, the other thing we had to adjust. Jewish people had to adjust. There's no temple. Right. right to bring sacrifice. Right. That's yeah. a whole different discussion. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's, that's, that's the rabbis. Yeah. If you want to talk about Judaism as a religion separate from Israelite religion, um, Judaism comes into existence right around the time, same time that Christianity comes into existence. Right. We're more siblings, children of a common uh, Israelite religion. The Israelite religion becomes non-functioning with the destruction of the temple. And guess what? Judaism, rabbinic Judaism is uh, is there to take the place. Let's look at what happens to Hone Hamanaka, okay? His, his later history, okay? So, let me start off again. The Gemara relates another story. The Gemara relates another story about Hone Ma'aga. Rabbi Yochan had said, all the days of the life of that righteous man, Honey, he was distressed over the meaning of this verse. A song of ascents, when the Lord brought back those who would return to Zion, we were like those who dream. 
he said to himself, is there really a person who can sleep and dream for 70 years? How is it possible to compare the 70 year exile in Babylonia to a dream? Okay. Straightforward. He doesn't understand the verse. Maybe he's not getting metaphor. I don't know. We were like dreamers. How can you dream for 70 years? Okay. Well, here's the story. One day he was walking along the road when he saw a certain man planting a carob tree. When he said to him, this tree, after how many years will it bear fruit? Okay. You're planting a tree. What do you expect to get out of it? Okay. The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Okay. But he said to him, it is obvious to you that you will be like 70 years that you expect to benefit from the tree. Right. So what he's saying is, it's going to, it won't produce fruit for 70 years. It's obvious that, is it obvious to you that you'll live 70 years? What was he really asking? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? You're not going to get anything. You're never going to see the profit on this thing. Okay. I, I think we skipped over. Uh, over yeah. He said to him, that man himself found a, a world full of carob trees. Just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planning for my descendants. Aha. Uh -huh. This is great. We should remember this. This would be useful for us now, especially with climate change. Okay. You know? Um, Okay, I've just said my political piece. What we, we think you go? Okay, no. We have to believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tony sat and ate bread. Sleep overcame him, and he slept. A cliff formed around him, and he disappeared from sight and slept for seventy years. Okay. Who? What? What story are we reminded of here? Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle, right? Okay. Who wrote it down first? We did. Okay. This was written down like 1400 years ago. Okay. We had that story first. Somebody took it from us. Okay. Uh huh. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. When he awoke, he saw a certain man gathering carrots from that tree. And he said to him, Are you the one who planted this tree? Uh huh. The man said to him, I am his son's son. Keep going. And he said to him, I can learn from this that I have slept for 70 years. And indeed, he saw that his donkey had sired several herds during those many years. <laughs> right. Okay. So, like, he wakes up, and by the way, there's like a whole field of donkeys. Okay. Go figure. Um, mind you, he only had one donkey. So, someone had to bring another donkey along. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Let's not worry about that. <laughs> Parthenogenesis. There's a lot of donkeys. Okay. Honey went home and said to the members of the household, Is the son of Honey Miguel here alive? Uh -huh. they, they said to him, His son is no longer with us, but his son's son is alive. He said to them, I am Honey Miguel. They did not believe him. Right. So he's like, his, his grandson is still alive. He says, Look, I'm Honey. <laughs> they don't believe him. Right. Right? Okay. Well, where is he going to go next? It's a rabbi. He's going to go to the study hall. Jack? Uh, he said to them, I am Honi um, Agel. They did not believe him. He went to the study hall where he heard the sages say about one scholar, his halachot are as enlightening and as clear as in the years of Honi Ham Agel. For when Honi Ama Agil would enter the study hall, he would resolve for the sages any difficulties that had. He's famous, <laughs> right? He's overhearing someone being compared to him. As pretty good praise, too. He figures, hey, maybe I can, you know, do some business here, right? When he said to them, I am he, but they did not believe him and did not pay him proper respect. Uh huh. No one's going to believe this, right? So the, the, it's like when they talk about, you know, if the Messiah came, what would happen? Well, it's very clear. He'd be locked up and, like, institutionalized for, you know, being insane, right? Because if you come and say hi, you know, I'm bringing about the Messianic era, they have a place for people who, you know, have those kinds of beliefs, right? And uh, and they put them on, you know, Thorazine or something like that, and, and they level them out. and. 
That's why the Messianic era is never going to come. Because who's going to believe it? Right? Who's going to believe it? Right? Okay. Hardy became very upset, prayed for mercy, and died. Rava said, this explains the folk saying that people say either friendship or death as one who has no friends is better off dead. Okay. What do you think of that statement? Well, it's like, okay, so I guess he hears this poor guy, he comes back, nobody believes him, mm -hmm. nobody's acting kindly or friendly to him, so I guess the statement's saying, yeah, well, you know, maybe the guy's better off dead, nobody believes him, well, nobody's accepting okay. him, that's maybe well, that's what he's saying. But how do you feel about that, that, that proverb? That's not so great. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do say that as you get older, one should um, stay in contact and have friends mm -hmm. because it helps you live your life. And once you start losing that uh, human contact, you're more likely to pass. I, I visited a woman once. I received a phone call. Uh, Rabbi, you need to visit so-and-so. She's talking about wanting to die. So I go and visit her. I visit her. She's got a beautiful home. She's got 24 hour care. It's all paid for. She's in reasonably good health. We had a nice chat. She says, look, Rabbi, I've outlived my husband. I've outlived all my friends. There's nobody I know is left alive. I'm really not interested in reading another book. I'm not interested in, you know, watching another TV show. You know, I know my husband was a pharmacist. I know what to take and how to do things. I'm never going to do that. But, you know, I'm just getting kind of tired of this. So what I said to her was, you know, you go to the doctors, right? Yeah. And they're trying to extend your life. Yeah. I said, you don't have to accept their help. Especially if it's irritating you, right? But, but she had a really good point. When you have no friends, life is a little bit miserable. Loneliness is a terrible thing. That's why you should always make friends with people who are younger than you. Because <laughs> then you'll never be alone. So always make new friends. Um, you know how you know when you're old? Yeah. That you have more doctors than you have friends. Uh, <laughs> That's in the Talmud somewhere. Your, 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 your doctor should be younger than you. Your lawyer should be younger than you. Your executor should be long, younger than you. It's all true. Uh, these are all true things. But, um, you know, it's interesting that um, for all of his great learning and all of his great knowledge, without someone to share it with, he's miserable, right? It's all about being able to share your life with people. That's the thing. He can't connect with anyone. He really mm -hmm. wants to, mm -hmm. but he can't do that. Right. Right. And he's not interested in like reestablishing, you know, starting from scratch and proving who he is. Right. It's like he's, he's, he, he just wants to be himself. It's, uh, it, it's kind of like that joke. It's a high holiday joke. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Yom Kippur. And uh, in between Shachrit uh, and, and Minfa, the fellow goes out and gets on a quick nine holes of gold. <laughs> and the angels say, you've heard the joke. The angel, I may have told you the joke. The angels say, you, you know, me. you need to punish him. So it's okay. Gets a hole in one. <laughs> oh, no one to tell it to. For his round of nine, his score is nine. <laughs> the angels say, what kind of punishment is that? Who can he tell about? <laughs> right? It's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's the whole joy of having a secret is having someone to <laughs> betray it to. Right, well, going back to Rip Van Winkle. Yeah. The American Indians, mm -hmm. American Native Indians, um, would have uh, rain dancers. Mm -hmm. And they also had the expression, um, I don't criticize someone to walk a mile in their moccasins. Right. Hillel says the same thing. Mm -hmm. So is there evidence that the Native Americans studied the Bible? I haven't heard that. I, I think it's more likely to say that 
These are universal truths, right? Almost every society comes up with something similar, right? What's truly interesting about the Jews, though, every other society, their gods have a narrative, right? Their gods have a birth, a youth, and then adulthood, and sometimes even death, right? Their gods have, have life stories, and they have wives, and they have fights, and all sorts of things, right? All the other nations, right? Whether it's, whether it's um, the Hindus, or, or the Norse, or the Greeks, whatever, right? And the gods are powerful, but they're not powerful over each other. What one god does, another one can't undo, certainly in the Greek system. And none of them have power over fate. Fate is the one thing they're all afraid of. Our religion's different. There is no narrative of God. God doesn't have a birth story. God doesn't have much of a person, well, other than anger, doesn't have much of a personality. There's no, you know, okay, you can look at God as a character through the Bible and see how God evolves, but we don't know what was here before. Even our creation narrative is incomplete because when God began to create the world and there was already water and there's already land, it's just disorganized, right? And in the Bible, God is the creator of all the other gods. And all the other gods are like, you know, the other gods of the other nations, right? So our story is non-universal in that way. But other than that, um, do unto others as they'd have you do unto you, I think that's pretty universal, right? Um, atheists can come up with good morality codes all on their own. Um, there's a great, uh, a great commentary to the holiness code where it says, you know, honor your mother and father, I am the Lord. Don't put a stumbling block before the blind, I am the Lord, right? Don't curse the deaf, I am the Lord. And ask the question, why do we need God to tell us this? We could figure this out on our own, right? Anybody could figure out, don't curse the blind, don't curse the deaf. Anyone could figure out, don't put a stumbling block before the blind. Why do we have to be commanded it? What are we learning from that? And the commentary answers, um, I am the Lord. The reason we do these things is that we should be holy. We need to be better people, right? You can get ahead by not being a good person, right? You can corner the market, you can play dirty, but that's not in the world's best interest. So I, I don't know that that uh, that any the natives were, were learning Talmud or anything like that. There's there there are legends or stories to go to about them being the twelve the twelve tribes. The sure, lost tribe. sure. There's stories about that. There's stories about um, about Solomon's gold coming from South America, <laughs> right? And there's stories that you know when the conquistadors went there, they were greeted warmly because they had seen white people before. Um, I'm not sure how well I, I, I buy that or not. Um, well, the modern DNA, yeah. it shows, for instance, that most Jews get their DNA taken, they'll have like, some European, Italian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Middle East, oh, yeah. Native Americans, um, I think their DNA was shown it from Central Asia, Mongolia. Yeah, yeah. So I think we get the scientific, but all religion, like, a lot of religions have a flood storm. Yeah. So it's something that it just it develops naturally. There's, well, what I think there was a really big flood in the Mediterranean. Yeah. I, I think there was. I think everybody remembers it. I, I read a theory once that said that uh, if you look at um, uh, the gates to the, uh, you know, where Malta is, where the gates to the Mediterranean, that actually, if you cut that off, Mediterranean would be a nice big valley, deep valley, not a nice valley. And then eventually it flooded. 
is one heck of a flood story. Eh? Mm -hmm. I think you would remember that you tell your children, they tell their children, even for a thousand generations, they can keep that story alive. Uh, is that what really happened? I don't know. You know, we, 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 we can't really know what happened 100 years ago or 300 years ago, right? All we have are our footprints. But, but this is Holy the Circle Maker. Right? Were there any other circle makers while he was sleeping? Did anybody else try to draw circles? Um, I'm not sure. I seem to recall somewhere in my memory that there's someone else who drew circles, but he didn't, they didn't get a name like that. So this was basically one off. I mean, it yeah. was it. It was it. He was he was the real deal. Uh, he was the real circle maker, right? Um, and and uh, and was a scholar. Just had this interesting showdown. So that's today's story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.